I hope, first of all, that you've experienced some of this relentless love of God that we just talked about. That's pretty amazing stuff. We talked about it last week, and we talk about it almost every week. I hope you've experienced this compassion. It was really cool, right, how he said this idea that uh, I hope that we don't measure God's compassion for us by our thin compassion for one another, right? So much of our experience of God's compassion for us is kind of around what we conceive and what we create in our minds and how we perceive other people to be compassionate towards us. God's compassion is out of this world. It's out of this world. For some reason this morning, as I was driving up here this morning, I was thinking about the parable of the lost sheep, how God said that, you know, uh, the good shepherd would leave the 99 to go find the one. That parable talks in terms of the heart of the father and the heart of the good shepherd who will leave the 99 to find the one. And I thought, you know, it's, got, it's actually quite painful, if you think about it, to be the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one. The 99 must be asking themselves, where did he go? Why has he left us all alone? What's going on here? Or, or maybe they're saying, we had a good thing going. <laughs> that one, all right, it's a casualty. We really should just stay together and be with one another. Why would the good shepherd leave to go get the one? But Jesus just makes it clear that this is the heart of the shepherd. The heart of the shepherd is one of compassion. The heart of God is the one of love. The heart of God is the one who would leave the 99 to go find the one lost sheep. We have some kind of, un we have some unlearning to do, okay, in our hearts and in our minds. In terms of uh, how we view the word, how God views the world. And I, I find that in my Christian walk, some of the hardest things that I have to learn, um, I have to keep revisiting, right? I have to keep either unlearning them or revisiting them. There might be some things that God just wants to drag me through. Oh, you didn't learn that lesson that time? All right, let's drag you through again and learn it again. Oh, you didn't learn it that time? All right, we're going to drag you through and learn it again. Sometimes there are things like that. Today I want to talk about mission again. We talk about it here a lot. Um, but I want to give you some real practical things about, about mission today. And you've got kind of all my sermon notes on your thing, and that's actually like faux pas. You should never do that because you're not going to pay attention to the thing I said. But I'm not going to look at those notes. But I want this talk this morning to me is so significant, so it can be so life-changing for you today. And I mean that. I'm not just saying that because that's a good line to drop when you want people to pay attention to your sermon. This can be so life-changing and game-changing, not just for you, but for the people in your life. Because you have to ask yourself the question, do you want the people you love, do you want the people in your life to come to know Jesus as their Savior, as you do? Just as you do, not as anyone else does, but as you do. If you love Jesus and you have a personal relationship with him, you've got to ask yourself the question, do you want the people in your life to love Jesus like you do? Or to be loved by Jesus like you do? So that's question number one. You've got to settle that in your mind. Jesus wants you to do that, but you've got to ask yourself that question. I know if you see a good movie, you think in terms of, man, I want so many people to see this movie. This was excellent. Or you see, you go to a great restaurant, you're like, oh, I know people who want to go here. You're a restaurant evangelist, a foodie evangelist. You're a movie evangelist. You're all sorts of evangelists. Question is, do you really want the people in your life to come into a personal relationship with Jesus like the one you've discovered? I believe for most of you, the answer is yes. It's always been yes for me, as far back as I can remember, even as a little kid, I can remember, oh, Fast Eddie, who used to be our pitcher in our baseball team. I remember being a middle school kid and wanting Fast Eddie to know Jesus as his Savior, but not knowing how in the world I could get him there. I remember my best friend, Ciro, Ciro Scarpula. I wanted so bad for Ciro to know Jesus as his Savior. I knew in my heart of hearts that Ciro was lost, even though he had a tattoo of Jesus on his heart. I just knew that he didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus like I did. And man, as a high schooler, I wanted Ciro to know Jesus. I wanted uh, several other of my friends to know Jesus. There are kids in my high school, I didn't want them to know Jesus at all. They were a big pain in my... But, so I didn't like them. And th that was me being immature, right? Like, 
I, you know, that was me being immature and not mature in my faith. But as I've grown, I obviously want everyone to come to know Jesus. On your piece of paper, there are three three openings, three three lines there. And by the end of the morning, I want you to write down three names of people that fit the description we're going to talk about in terms of wanting, yeah, in terms of people God is bringing into your life. So the topic of the talk is called the persons of peace, the people of peace. This is something that we gather from the gospel and from Jesus and in a pattern that he kind of presented to the disciples. Um, a number of years ago, my life changed and Allison's life changed and several other people in our community changed before I ever came to Relevant. And we started asking ourselves a question, how do we reorient? You can write this down, this one's gold nugget, free, it's not on your yellow sheet of paper. How do we reorient? Reorient. How do we shift our orientation? How do we reorient our lives for the sake of those who do not know Jesus, but also for the sake of those who would not step foot in the doors of the church? So if the church looked like this, we're going to tear this down anyway today. We're just covering up the stuff that the school puts up. If the church looked like a triangle, right? We just tried to get people into the church, you know? We just try to get people into the church. We'll put a little steeple on there, right? Can you guys see that a little bit? Do you want me to draw another one over here for you? Okay, lovely. We'll do this, right, little steeple. If our job, and traditionally, we just try to get people into the church, into the church, into the setting, into our events, into our small groups, into our communities, we're asking ourselves, how do we reorient our lives for the sake of don't know, those who don't know Christ? And basically what we did was we kept the church upside down on its side. And kind of made it more like a, hey, we got to go into the world rather than just trying to get people into the church. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we just kind of push the church on its side. All right? We just kind of push the church on its side. And we said, how do we go into the world, you know, instead of just trying to get people into the church? Josh Leone is going to go to Spain and not going to try and get people into the church, into the church. But rather, he's going into the world, right? Josh is going to go with a bunch of people. Some of them, most of them Christians, and he's going to go into the world to try and capture the hearts and men and women of children for Jesus, right? All right. So we are asking ourselves this question. How do we reorient our lives? Because we are good Christian people. We are living people who are salt and light, but nobody was following us into the church. None of our friends who saw us, who loved what they enjoyed, were following us into the church. How many of you have friends like that? Right? You're in their life. They see you. You're attractive in terms of your faith. There are things that <laughs> there are things that they admire about you, and you think for sure I'm being salt and light. But they're not taking steps in the direction of Jesus per se. So let's go to let's go to the scripture really quick. Let's look at Luke, Luke chapter ten, verse five to eleven. That reference is on your page. Jesus is about to send his disciples. The interesting thing here, uh, we talked earlier about there needs to be a balance of deeper life and mission. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. He didn't just do deeper life stuff. He did mission. And we have to just simply say to ourselves, you know, Jesus, I understand why i got to do mission my, right now. My life is a mess. I'd really like to get everything balanced. I'm no witness right now. I'm no good to any non-Christian. I'm barely hanging on by a string. Do you know what Jesus would say to you? Let's go do mission together. He would say that to you. He would care for you. He would comfort you. But he wouldn't let you stay there. Because something about Jesus' discipleship and what he did with his followers was that he took them on mission and he sent them on mission no matter what the condition of their life was. As if to say there's something fundamental to our success, our health, and our well-being when we not only just look inward, but we look out. So we just kind of have to trust Jesus' lead on this. Okay, in terms of going out. That is fundamental to our health and well-being. It's what we were designed to do. Right? So here's Jesus with his disciples, and he's about to send them out. And he hasn't resurrected yet. He hasn't died yet. He's going to send them out with a message about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was just always talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus had plenty of good news, right, in terms of the kingdom of heaven and the good news that he was preaching. So here's what he says. Whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. Now this is a specific strategy that Jesus designed for his disciples. First, if those who live there are peaceful, 
then the blessing will stand. If they are not, then the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. And if you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go into its streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from your feet, our feet, to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. I'm not encouraging that, by the way. And, and know this, the kingdom of God is near. We'll get that one later. That, the, that wiping the dust off the feet, I think that was for a specific era. But there's a principle there too, okay? Um, and know this, the kingdom of God is near. Let's go back to that first verse, Jeff. I want to just go over some principles. Just want to kind of extract some principles here. And they're on your sheet of paper, okay? Um, Jesus talks about, uh, be on the lookout for the person of peace. The person who welcomes you into their home. That welcomes you into their house. Keep going, Jeff. A couple more verses where it says there, the next one. Yeah. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. Jesus was sending out his disciples into towns and villages, towns and villages that Jesus was about to go into and do some of his preaching, okay? And as he sends them out, he simply says to them, look, look for the people who are welcoming you. Look for the people who are willing to show you hospitality. Look for the people who are willing to invite you into their home. And if they invite you into their home, and if they show you hospitality, and they welcome you, stay with them. Stay with them. <laughs> Linger with them. Be with them. Look for the people who will listen to you. And upon listening to you, respond to you with kindness. And upon responding to you, are even willing to serve you. On your sheet of paper, you've got four things there. Okay, that a person of peace will do. Here's what I'm saying, practically speaking. As you go about your life, as you go about your day, as you go about your business, look for people of peace. These are going to be people who God brings into your life who welcome you into their life, into their lives, who listen to you when you talk about your life. Maybe even when you talk about the gospel. Maybe when you even talk about the good news. Maybe when you even talk about how Jesus is helping you out. Maybe even when you talk about your struggles and your problems and your challenges. People who listen to you. People who even respond to you. And to the message. Now, these disciples had a very specific kind of message Jesus was giving them. But... If you recall, over every Sunday we give you a message that is a really good news. It's a message that you can actually share with somebody else. And then look for people who will serve you. We refer to these people as people of peace. People of peace. And so for us, as we were doing, kind of pushing the church on its side over here, all of a sudden we started looking for people of peace. And we found people of peace... I just drew three circles. It's not a big deal. You guys don't have to worry about that. Just imagine three circles over there. We found these people of peace. We started now looking for the people that we would really love to see in a relationship with Jesus. We just, they were entertaining us. We were being entertained by them. They welcomed us into their life. They were even willing to kind of, I don't know, help us out, invite us along, serve us in, in different ways. We weren't preaching the gospel, so to speak. But these were people who, they were peaceful. They didn't kind of reject us. Does that make sense? You have people in your life. It makes sense? Okay. You're with me? All right. Good. Good. Um, here, look at the next three things. Person of peace. I probably said all this. Welcomes a relationship between you and them. They invite you into other relationships they have, such as connecting you with other friends and family members. And they're gatekeepers into other relationships and even ministry opportunities. They invite you into opportunities to minister to others and serve alongside of them. So I just kind of ran through that real quick. 
These are kind of people of peace in your life. It means a shift in our mindset from thinking, how do people serve me? It means a complete kind of shift in terms of what is Jesus trying to do in their life? Everybody you meet, what is Jesus trying to do in their life? And if there are people, and Jesus says, be on the lookout. I'm going to encourage you, be on the lookout for people of peace. They're welcoming, listening, responding, they're serving. In Acts chapter 10, verse 19 to 21, uh, we get a, like another example of this happening. There's two significant examples. One is of Cornelius. Let me just read through it. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, he was sitting on a housetop and God came to him in a vision and told him, don't tell me anything's unclean. Whatever I've made is clean. And all of a sudden, Peter was thinking about being a Jew and how do Jews associate with Gentiles. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a Gentile shows up to his house. Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. He wasn't supposed to worry because they were Gentiles. These were people who were coming to see Peter and essentially they, they show up to the house. Go ahead. So Peter went down and said, I, I'm the man you are looking for. Why have you come? That's it. That's all I have. <laughs> Cornelius, who's a Gentile, has sent his servants to go get Peter because he wants to hear the good news. It says that Cornelius was a God-fearing man. And essentially, Cornelius becomes the gatekeeper, the first Gentile to become a Christian, to become a Christ follower. And he essentially is what we call like a person of peace, someone who welcomes Peter, someone who welcomes the good news, someone who's responding to what he heard, and then someone who invites Peter into his household to stay and lingers and begins to serve Peter. And then Cornelius becomes kind of a gatekeeper to whole nother community, a whole nother group of people who have yet to hear the gospel. Another example of this in, in the New Testament is Lydia. Lydia is a, a, a rich woman. Let's read what it says about Lydia. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank. This is now talking about Paul. Paul the Apostle goes to um, a riverbank where they thought people would be meeting for prayer. We sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth, who worshiped God. And as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. And if you agree that I'm a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us, urged us until we agreed. You are wonderful people. Wonderful people. I know that there are people in your life who enjoy being with you. And I know that you want those people to come to know Jesus as their Savior. I'm saying now begin to look at them as people of peace. And maybe you don't know who they are. So here's how you can identify a person of peace. So here's where I want you to start today. Who are the individuals that God repeatedly puts on your heart to pray for? Is there anybody in your circle that God repeatedly puts in your heart to pray for? Probably yes, right? Who are the individuals who seem to always show up when you need something or need assistance? Do you have people like that in your life? They just seem to show up when your tree falls down in your backyard? Or your snow comes, you need shoveling, and they're not a believer. They just seem to serve. They want to be near you. Guess what? They're not attracted to you. Jesus is saying that there's something inside of you that they're attracted to. Who are the individuals that invite you into their lives, the relationships, the celebrations? You ever have an annoying somebody that just wants you to come over, 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 over again? Come to the birthday party the celebration? You don't have that? They just may be a person of peace. Maybe they're not an annoying person. But maybe they're the person God is putting in your life and saying, these are the people of peace. Over the past year, who are the individuals who have been most responsive, not respective, responsive to the gospel? Here's the thing about this. This is just not a one-hit wonder. Why I'm bringing it up and why maybe we're spending some time is that this is something I know you deep down want in your heart, but this is something that take, requires some discipline. It requires some over and over action. I want you to know everything in the world, everything in your world is working against this from happening. Because in order for this to happen, you need to have some margin in your life. You know what margin is? Do you remember what margin is? Not the butter thing, not the fake butter. I don't even know what that is. But margin is the room on the side of the page, right? 
I love a yellow notebook that has the margin on the left side of the page with a, either a red stripe or a green stripe. I cut the margins off this page here so I can fit more notes in here. Usually the, the, the set margins are bigger. And you live a life that you're constantly pushing away the margin. Because there's no room for you to spend time with people of peace, is there? You have so much going on in your life. There's so much happening that the world is working against this priority of God in your heart and your life. So what I want you to do is identify who are the people of peace in your life. Go ahead and start thinking about that now. Who are the people of peace? The people who are welcoming you, listening to you, responding to you, and serving you in your life. You know, for us, um, we had this family that was a person of peace. Um, her name was Carrie originally. And then we had a couple other names. I'm kind of just going to leave them nameless. Um, and we just started saying yes to their invitations. We started saying yes to the birthday parties that their kids are inviting us to. We started having to spend money that we didn't want to spend on birthday gifts that we didn't want to buy. For birthday parties that we didn't necessarily want to go to. Because we didn't necessarily have time. But we started saying yes to people. Because we, for some reason, we we're just kind of buying into this concept that there's people of peace in our lives and that God wants us to respond to them. So, first, identify the people of peace, okay? So write those names down. I want you guys to write names down, okay? So I want you to write some names down. Who are the people of peace in your life? Go ahead, write them down. Who needs a pen? Anybody need a pen? I want you to write, have you guys written names down? I'm going to ask for your names by the end of this, by the way. So you better start writing names down. Yeah. Okay. And if you're a guest this morning and you don't even believe this stuff, you just may be a person of peace. That's why you're here. Write names down. I'm going to ask you. Here's the thing. You will never see those people come into a relationship with Jesus unless we as a community hold each other accountable. So this is a little bit of a workshop. This is the church being on mission. This is not just inspirational thoughts for you. You can reject this and don't do it. But I beg you, someone's eternity hangs in the balance. And your lack of wanting to write anybody's names down because, eh, I don't have to do it, don't do it. <coughs> yes, Jane. Are these supposed to be people outside of our own family? They could be family members. They can be family members. Yeah, sure, they could be family members. Yeah. It says here that Lydia's whole household was saved. Yeah, they could be family members if you think they're people of peace. In, in their life, in your life? Are, Ten. These, are these people that are non-believers? Yes, these are non-believers. These aren't believers we're just trying to recruit into our church. These are non-believers. And you may have done this before. Like the other day, I, I had to write myself, I had to remind myself who my people of peace was. I wasn't doing anything with the people of peace in my life. I have, some, I have three specific, I have a bunch of guys in my life who welcome me, serve me, listen, respond to the gospel, and I'm not taking any next steps. Any steps of courage. Any steps of kind of the next high challenge. So, Rick, you were saying, hey, my friends, for example, my people, people peace may not come to church, so what I need to do is create a new pathway for them to learn what it's like to live in the kingdom of God. That's a big phrase. I need to create a pathway. I need to create some environment, some space for them to learn what it's like to live in the kingdom of God. And so I haven't done anything with my people of peace for a little while because I'm distracted by so many other things. So this is why I'm bringing it up today. Jane, to your question, I think we have people, family, I'd like for you to look beyond your family a little bit um, here in this context. Because I think you always have those family, you know? Um, but I think you need to look beyond the family and look into other people of peace who may be gatekeepers. I was hanging out with my people of peace friends. Recently we were at the beer garden in Asbury Park, it was St. Patrick's Day, and we were all there around the table, and these guys, and the table was split half, there were six girls, six guys, and I was sitting with these six guys, and all of a sudden, as I was listening to them speak, one of the guys was comforting <laughs> another guy um, about something going on in his life, and I thought, could this guy be a pastor one day? But like he's not a Christ follower. But I totally heard him talk like a pastor. And I knew it wasn't my idea. I felt deep inside that it was the Holy Spirit saying to me, 
that guy could be a pastor. That guy could just be pastoring and shepherding his friend. He's just missing one piece. And that's just pointing people to Jesus as the ultimate comforter. Does that make sense? So, people of peace. All right, I I don't want to belabor something. You got what a person of peace looks like Mm -hmm. and is? Yes. Good morning. I have a question. Good morning. What if your person of peace isn't very peaceful? Yeah. So remember that. Remember that thing. Remember that thing that says, "I'll I'll wipe the dust off your mm-hmm. feet." So you don't have to stay. You don't have to be in that relationship. Jesus actually gives his disciples permission to just wipe the dust off the feet of the cities and the towns that reject them. Isn't that interesting? Not everybody will accept you. Not everybody will welcome you. And I'm giving you permission to say, okay, time to move on. Find another person of peace in your life. It's what he says to his disciples, right? That's kind of like wiping the dust. I'm I'm almost giving you permission because you might be the kind of person, I'm going to linger, I'm going to stay. I I, I want to, you know, fight this out the long haul. I I would say there's some really low-hanging fruit out there that we haven't even tried to pluck. Okay? Now, you... So, what's the next step? So let's see here. After you identify your person of peace, begin to pray for them. Look, that's fundamental to this. That is so fundamental. Begin to pray for them. So in a few minutes, you're going to write down your people of peace, and we're going to pray for them all together, okay? Create margin. So be intentional about the relationship. Spend time together. Find common hobbies and interests. Serve together. So that's the next step. Find time together. Spend time together. That means you have to spend less time with each other. One of the things that you, was in our survey was loving community. Remember that loving community component we talked about in your survey that you did? Loving community was one of the things that we were kind of like, kind of in the middle of. And one of the components of loving community that the survey said was that you guys, and maybe us as a church, don't spend enough time together as a church um, outside of church-related activities. That might be a good sign of a healthy, loving community. But one of the things that I loved from the beginning of my time here at Relevant is how little time you guys spend with each other. Because you are spending time with people. And I don't want a church that just hangs out with each other all the time. I love that you have friends and circles of influence and people in your life that that all you you need to do is look up and see that these might be people of peace in your life. If all we're doing is spending time with each other, then we're not creating margin even in our faith community to say, hey, how do we spend time with people of peace? Introduce them to your friends, to your family, to your missional community. We are a missional community right here. We're a church, but we're a community on mission. So you can introduce them to each other and look for opportunities to share Christ with them. Look for opportunities to share Christ with them. One of the questions we begin to ask ourselves, it's very simple. God, what are you saying to me about Tom? And what would you like me to do about it? Maybe God would say to you, you know what? Go invite Tom to have a cup of coffee. And you invite Tom to have a cup of coffee and see what happens next. Go invite someone to eat some food. You can do that. Go invite someone to do something together. So everybody got people of peace down? Okay. There's a lot of more kind of next steps. What do we do next with this? But I just wanted to start there. Let me let me do one thing. Let's see. Which board we use? We'll use this one. Alright. So this is a, a triangle that we we uh, we kind of that's created. Okay? And so when we look at our people of peace, maybe I've shown you this. You can draw this on the back of your page. If you want to draw an inverted triangle, draw an inverted triangle. So when Alice and I identified our people of peace, what we started next to identify was kind of what were the ladders? What were the things we could do with them that would just get them to the next level deeper? If this was a personal relationship with Jesus down here, okay? If the goal was a personal relationship with Jesus, and we drew an inverted triangle, we would kind of say, okay, what's the thing we could do with them? Imagine a little Donkey Kong board game. What's the thing we could do with them to get them a little deeper in our relationship with Jesus, in their relationship with Jesus? How do we get them growing in a personal relationship with Christ? Sometimes it meant just inviting them over. Inviting them over was the thing to do with them. You know? 
and, and hanging out and spending time and just being in community. Jesus threw parties all the time, right? And at those parties, things happened. Um, dog, you know, you threw a pig roast and you had hundreds of your friends over. That was a great first thing to do with people of peace in your life. So you got to just think, who's the person of peace? There's a little stick figure there. You can't see it. What's the next thing you can do with them? Okay. And then, and then if they say yes, oh, that's awesome. Okay. And this might be a lower challenge experience. You might not want to take that person to peace and say, hey, I got a woman's Bible study on Thursday night. We pray for three hours. <laughs> oh, boy. And then come back next week and be a pastor. My person of peace left me. <laughs> right. I would too. And I like you. <laughs> so don't do that. Okay. But rather say, hey, I've run them out to coffee. And they say, yes. And you might come back and be pastor. We didn't talk about anything spiritual. Oh, yes, you did. Everything you talked about is spiritual. You talk about their kids, that's spiritual. You talk about husbands and problems and work. It's all spiritual. It's all God's all concerned about it. And then you say, okay, you know, this person of peace said yes. And, and what's the next thing you can do with them? You know, that maybe it might be a little more intimate. might be a little more personal. But that, you don't have to rush through that. God will answer your questions. God will show you the pathway. If you are learning to live in the kingdom, if you're going to a Bible study, if you're going to church, if you're serving other people in your community, those are all things you eventually can invite people into at the right time. But here, I'm really just trying to set your new mindset. Who are the people of peace? And all of a sudden, I got like a Sesame Street song going on in my head, you know? Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood. In your neighborhood. And who, come on, all together. Are the people in your neighborhood? They're the people that you meet each day. Is that how it goes? After the week after that, I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you about your people of peace. We're going to be a little relentless about this. I want to be a little relentless about this. Because I want to see your people of peace come to Jesus. If they come to Jesus, and then I believe they'll come into the church. But they may not. Here's what I know. Here's what I know is going to happen with all of our people of peace. That they are gatekeepers. There are households waiting to be saved. They are church planters and pastors. They are people who will reach people that we'll never be able to reach. Amen? Amen. So just imagine it happening. Envisioning it happening. It's one of the hardest things we'll have to do as a body. So keeping us accountable to it will be worth every effort. All right? Lord Jesus, I thank you for this pattern that you've presented for us. I thank you for every person here and the web of influence they have. Wow, you have strategically placed them in the right places with the right people at the right time in their life. And I thank you that you have clothed them with gentleness and kindness and humility and compassion. And so now I pray for all the people of peace we've named, the ones that we've yet to name, the people that now are going to come into our lives and we're going to see them as new in new light and say, whoa, they're actually a person of peace and they're ripe for the gospel and the good news. But Lord, I pray for the courage it's going to take us to speak gentle, kind, gracious words to them in their time of need, in their time of uh, uncertainty, uh, when they are looking for hope and direction. I pray you give us wisdom to know the right things to say, the courage to say it. And Lord, we would trust that the same unfailing love that rescued us will rescue them. God, I love you. I thank you for this hope we have. We pray for our teenagers that are going away this weekend, that you would fill them with the overwhelming love of Jesus. They would know you personally and deeply. God, I pray for those who are coming who are not yet saved, that this would be a weekend of salvation for them. You would soften their hearts. You would lead them to a place of grace knowing you. 
Lord, I pray for this church, our body, that we would indeed continue to see uh, the harvest come in of souls. But we just thank you, Lord. You put us in a place of just hard work and labor. So I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would do the work that we so ambitiously want to see get done. We trust in you. You're the one who's going to do it. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.